Hi and welcome again to Word for the Week. Today we are listening to Jesus' messages to the church in Philadelphia and the church in Laodicea from the book of Revelation, his vision uh, gifted to John. And uh, as ever, we're going to hear David Suchet uh, read these passages to us. We begin with Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens no one can shut, and what he shuts no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is Jesus' message to the church in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia was the youngest of the cities that Jesus addressed. It was founded around 200 years uh, BC by the king uh, Attalus II. Uh, Philadelphia sat in the center of a fertile plain. Uh, the region is known for its agriculture and for its wine production. And still today in that area of Turkey, wine is grown there or grapes for wine um, is grown there. Uh, the founding of the city of Philadelphia was very strategic. Uh, the location was at the centre of uh, a place where various trade routes crossed uh, past each other. And the city was founded by, as I say, Attalus II, who was a Hellenist. He was a Greek king and he wanted to export Greek culture and Greek religion uh, to the east. Uh, that Asia of, uh, area of Asia Minor was a real melting pot of faiths and cultures and traditions. And Attalus II, he wanted to uh, spread uh, the Greek gods' uh, messages, the Greek religion, uh, Greek culture, Greek language to the east, to the Persian uh, remains of the Persian Empire. And so Philadelphia, from its inception, was a missionary city. If you would visit there, you'd see great uh, thoroughfares where all the trade uh, routes pass by each other. And lining those uh, uh, thoroughfares or throughfares, uh, there would be many Greek temples. Uh, temples to all of the Greek gods, but particularly to the god Dionysius, who was the god of wine, Dionysius. And so this was a really uh, tough place to live as a Christian. Um, lots of uh, different religions all vying for supremacy, uh, the official cult of the uh, empire being promoted there, uh, Greek gods, Greek religion being promoted in the many different temples uh, that lined the streets. Um, and not only that, that the Christians are having difficulties with the local Jewish community. Uh, described by Jesus as uh, not real Jews, a synagogue of Satan, people who are pretending uh, to be Jews. And it, it's clear that the, the small Christian church um, is in some conflict with the, the Jewish uh, community there. And many of the Christian believers would have been from uh, a Jewish background, um, certainly those who are not from a pagan uh, background. This church is a small church, uh, I presume that they are a struggling church. Uh, Jesus says to them that you have little strength and he also commends them for enduring patiently. It would be really easy for this church to become um, inward looking and self-focused and defensive in some way. And yet Jesus has this um, challenge for them. He says, I've placed before you an open door. 
The doors I open, no one can shut, and the doors I shut, no one can open. To this um, small church, this beleaguered church, this, this church that seems so fragile and weak in the midst of this city that has been uh, founded for the express re- uh, purpose of spreading uh, uh, polytheism, the, the religion of, the, of many gods of the Greek um, nation. Jesus says, I've set an open door before you. This is a missionary city, a missionary city for uh, Greek religion and culture, uh, the worship of idols, the worship of false gods. And Jesus says, I want my church to um, be a missionary church. I've set an open door before them. There's an echo here of Jesus' call to his people uh, to look outwards. Remember what he said to his disciples? Uh, the fields are white unto harvest, but the labourers are few. What did he say when he uh, ascended to heaven? But he said, go into all the nations and make disciples of all peoples. And he says to this little church in Philadelphia, this struggling church, you are to play your part in this as well. I've set before you an open door that no one can close. Paul, when he writes to the church in Corinth, will also speak of an open door before him. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. A great door for effective work has opened to me, though there are many who oppose me. A hundred years ago, uh, we in the West, in the Western church, would have considered China and Korea to be closed nations, uh, closed to the Christian gospel. Uh, Western missionaries were thrown out and it was very difficult to get in there to help and support the church in uh, Korea and in China. Yet today, some of the largest and fastest growing churches in the world are found in South Korea and in China and they've spawned their own missionary movements. Just 50 years ago, we have have thought of the churches behind uh, the Iron Curtain as being churches in closed nations. And yet when I studied at Bible College, at London Bible College, I studied with students from Romania and Bulgaria who were going back to their lands to be missionaries in their own countries. 10 years ago, it would have been unthinkable uh, that there would be churches in Iran and spreading across the Middle East. And yet today there are hundreds, if not thousands, of hidden churches in that land. These countries that were closed are now opening up to the gospel. The Lord is the one who determines which nations are closed and which nations are open for his good purposes. And so he says to this this little church, this struggling church that has little strength, I've placed before you a door no one can shut. And he gives them a promise. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. As I say, Philadelphia was lined, uh, the streets were lined with Greek temples. Worship to uh, the pagan gods was offered there. And in front of those temples, there would be porticos, and those porticos would be held up uh, by great columns. And the tradition was that those uh, temples would be founded by benefactors, wealthy uh, citizens who wanted to give money to the gods to ask their uh, blessing and to seek their favour. And so they would give money and the temple would be built with those, uh, those donations, those money. And uh, everybody who made a donation, who was a benefactor of the temple, well, their names would be inscribed on those pillars and where they'd come from uh, would be written on there. So everybody knew who the benefactors were and they could expect a special favour from the God in whose name they'd made a donation. Well, Jesus says, "Um, you little church, you struggling church, I will make you pillars and you'll be pillars in the temple of my God. And I'll write his name uh, upon you. Uh, His name will be inscribed upon you. And uh, the kingdom of heaven, uh, the city of my God, our God, will be written on there. What that means is Jesus is saying to this church, you belong to God. 
and hold on to him and I'll write his name upon you and uh, he will bless you and he will watch over you and uh, he will say that he is holding you up and he is protecting you. If you go to that region today, you can see, still see the ruins of these temples and all that is left uh, when the temples have fallen are, are the stumps of the pillars. You can see the Greek uh, pillars even to this day. And if you search, I'm sure you can find the inscriptions upon them. Uh, they are all that remains. And Jesus says to this church, um, hold on to me and I will hold on to you. And again, there's an echo here of John 6, verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. There is encouragement here for us today. Uh, we who so often as Christians feel, feel weak and outnumbered, um, uh, feel that the missionary task is too great for us, uh, feel that uh, we're about to be overwhelmed by our culture and by the, the rival gods around us. Uh, Jesus says to us who are tempted to look inward and to uh, solely concentrate on what's going on within our church uh, communities, Look, I've set before you an open door. He calls us to be missionary churches today. And the question for each of us surely must be, well, which doors is Jesus opening up to us? Where are the opportunities for us uh, to witness to his love and to his grace? And there's an encouragement here as well. And Jesus is still building his temple today and building us into the foundations of his people. And he's still uh, calling us his pillars and writing the name of God upon us. He's still holding us. He's still uh, preserving us. He's still protecting us. He will not let us go. He will lose none of those that the Father has given him, but he will raise us up with them on the last day. That's the message to the church in Philadelphia. And now we turn our attention to the message to the church in Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover up your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Laodicea is the last of the seven churches that Jesus addresses directly. And like Philadelphia, it's located on the same rich agricultural plain. Um, Laodicea was a wealthy city, and not quite as wealthy as Ephesus or Pergamon, but for a small city, it was certainly the wealthiest in the region. And that's because as well as being an agricultural centre, it was a centre for banking and for tax collection. This area is prone to earthquakes. We still hear of earthquakes in the region today. And uh, Laodicea was destroyed twice <clears throat> um, uh, in sort of rapid succession in AD 20 and in AD 60. So around the time, um, or sort of certainly just before uh, this letter would have been uh, written. So the events there would have been known to uh, John and his hearers. 
In AD 20, the city was damaged by an earthquake and because of its loyalty to the Roman emperor and to the empire, uh, the emperor gave uh, gifts and tax breaks so that the city could be rebuilt. And so the city was restored. And then in AD 60, 40 years later, uh, the city was completely destroyed by an earthquake. It was razed to the ground. Once again, aid was offered from the coffers of the emperor. Uh, but this time the citizens refused that aid and they rebuilt the city themselves from their own savings, uh, from the gifts of those who lived around in the region. Laodicea was a byword for self-sufficiency. And the challenge is to a church who are self-sufficient, who are able to rely upon their own wealth and their own riches. Jesus says to this uh, self-sufficient, you could even say self-satisfied church, woe to you, for you are neither hot nor cold. You say that you are rich, but you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. What is, what is Jesus saying uh, to the church here? Well, to fully understand this, you need to get something of the geography of the region. You have Laodicea and nearby you have two neighbouring cities. One is Herapolis. Herapolis is fed by um, hot springs. It's a place of healing. It's a, a spa town. It's a centre where people go uh, for water therapy, where they rest in the hot springs and that does them good. It helps with their rheumatism or their arthritis. So Herapolis is known for its hot springs. And nearby also there is Colossae. And Colossae is fed by cold uh, springs, cold water springs uh, that spring up uh, nearby. And the cold water, well, that is refreshing. It's rejuvenating. It, it kind of wakes you up in the morning. It's good to drink uh, lovely, cold, fresh water. Um, Laodicea, they had no springs of their own and so their water is imported and archaeologists have found the clay pipes in the site of Laodicea um, and discovered how the water was piped in. Herapolis was a little bit nearer than Colossae and so the water was piped in from Herapolis, um, hot water. But it's a number of miles at distance, the pipes are long, and so as the water travelled from Herapolis to Laodicea, it would cool down somewhat. So by the time it arrived in Laodicea, it would be lukewarm. Um, not only that, um, but the pipes are silted up with calcium carbonate, and that would come out of, uh, of the water as, as, the, as the water cooled and silt up the pipes. And that would give, them a give the water a horrible taste. Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. And these are his words of rebuke. You are neither hot nor cold. You're not a centre for healing. The church has lost its, its role as being a place of healing where people can find um, health and healing and wholeness and salvation. And he says, you're, you're, you're not cold either. You're not refreshing. You don't give new life. You don't give spiritual refreshment. You don't give uh, peace, forgiveness, uh, grace. You're no longer a centre for that either. Uh, the church has truly lost its way as it has become uh, self-satisfied. And Jesus says, you are lukewarm. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. If you'd have drunk the water of Laodicea, if you'd have tasted this horrible, lukewarm water um, with calcium carbonate, like a soapy kind of uh, substance kind of, kind of uh, coming forth with it, uh, you would spit it out of your mouth. Jesus' words are actually stronger than spit here. He says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. He's about to vomit up uh, this church because they've lost their identity. They've lost the sense of who they are as the people of God. But Jesus says to this church, you are the church whom I love. And because I love you, I'll rebuke you. And because I um, love you, I will give you some discipline. Jesus loves this church and he stands ready to meet with them. 
he stands at the door and he knocks and he waits for them to show him hospitality. He waits for them to invite him in. He longs to sit with them not sitting with them as uh, they being his servants, but sitting with them as friends. He longs to share his riches with them. He invites them, buy from me gold refined in fire so that you can become rich. You wealthy people, you self-satisfied people, you people who you think have everything, well, come to me and come and find with me the things that really matter. You can be rich, you can know my blessing, you can know my favour. I'll give you white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. They can find grace and forgiveness and peace. They can find a new start. Put salve on your eyes so that you can see. They can see clearly, they can have a new perspective uh, the perspective that Jesus uh, gives. There is an offer here that um, is an echo of the offer in Isaiah 55, where God says to his people, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? and your labour on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. To this blind church, Jesus offers to open their eyes. To this poor church, Jesus offers them uh, his riches, although they think they are rich. Uh, to this lukewarm church, uh, Jesus offers uh, to give them um, a new life, uh, the water of life that springs up from within, that he prof um, promises uh, so often in the Gospels and in this book of Revelation. Jesus said this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus loves those who are self-satisfied and self-sufficient today. He loves us enough to rebuke us and to discipline us and to call us to be earnest and to repent, to turn around and to put things right. He stands at the door of the self-satisfied today and he knocks and he just asks to be invited in that he might share with us his bread, his life, the bread of life. Let's receive him afresh today. Amen.